Hey folks, Roland Martin of TV One, the Tom Drone Morning Show, and you're listening to We Act Radio. Do something. I get so high, I get so low. I get afraid, no place to go. Still I can My name is Elena Volkova and I'm a photographer. Anacostia is a historically Native American and African American area in Washington DC. The project aims to document people of Anacostia in wet plate collodion portraits, a historic photographic process, and represent people in this day and time. Back in 19th century when this process was practiced, people used to sit sometimes between 2 and 15, 30 seconds for a portrait. That's why nobody smiled in pictures, because you just had to, you know, you couldn't hold a smile without it turning into a grin, right, for 30 seconds. So, as we take this portrait of Baba, you can just notice how bright the flashes are. It's something that we compensate for seconds of sitting under bright sun without blinking. I get so high, I get so low. People love to be represented in portraits and sitting for a portrait done using a historic process really creates that bridge between past and present. And we hear people say things like, oh my God, I look like my grandfather. And in Anacostia, people are connected to their past. It allows people to learn history and to see themselves represented in historic photographs. When daguerreotypes were invented in 1830s, only the wealthy people could afford sitting for a portrait. And the representation that exists of people in daguerreotypes focuses on people with means. When collodion was uh, invented in 1850s, we have much wider representation of people of all sorts of walks of life. And it was a much more democratized process. The process starts with a tin plate that's coated in black paint and we pour collodion. Collodion was originally invented for medical purposes during the Civil War, it was used to bind um, bandages and simultaneously was created as a, as a photographic process as well. Collodion is, a, is like a liquid band-aid. It allows silver stick to the surface. So after we pour collodion, we put the plate into a silver nitride bath and silver particles get stuck to the surface of the plate. This is called sensitizing. And after that, the plate needs to be exposed to light instantly while the plate is still wet. So we put it in the camera and we expose it to large amounts of light. So I have three very powerful lights that create light instantaneously and expose the plate to light. And where the plate is exposed to light, it, the silver hardens. So that's how we get highlights. And shadow areas, that's where the silver didn't get hardened, so it washes off in the development process. And that's how we have highlights and shadows. Now we are ready to put the plate into fixer and in Fixer, it transforms from a negative image to a positive image. An Acostia Portraits project allows me to practice my craft. 
So for me, it's a really great joy to go in, create a portrait session and challenge myself with photographing people. I am interested in historic processes because it allows me to practice my craft hands-on. I enjoy the unpredictability of the end results when it's good. Sometimes I have to start over and repeat the process again and again. But in the end, I love wet plate because of those surprises. Wet collodion excites me as a photographer because it renders the light and color unlike any other photographic process. And I love surprises and I love not having 100% control over the process. One of the most exciting things for me as a photographer is that relationship between me and the sitter and then the viewer bringing their own meaning into reading the images. I like creating portraits because understanding individuality, humanity and beauty of others helps us understand ourselves. This experience is like is, 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 is extremely rewarding. It's all very uh, very nice and exciting. It's a rewarding process and teaches you a lot. Definitely like a one in a lifetime experience for me. Um, I love I have a great appreciation for photography and especially like older forms of photography and so just to be a part of such a, a vintage process in this time is really um, is really amazing to experience. You know, it's, it's, it has more components to it. Like uh, you can't see everything that's going on behind you here, but it's, it's so intricate and it's so like, you know, everything has to be timed right with the place, has to be heated. This is so amazing. As opposed to digital, you know, it's like a new age technology. You don't really get to see the intricacies because everything is being done inside the, the digital process. I feel like I'm like traveling through space and time with the whole process. And it, I think that's the like, most exciting part about it, like to uh, actually feel like a piece of history or like the way they did things historically. It's just amazing. Elena Volkova, artist behind Anacostia Portraits. And I just want to say thank you, Anacostia community, for welcoming my project and for all of the participants. And I hope to see you all again. And this is We Act Radio. Do something. And there you go. All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, brothers and sisters, friends and enemies, welcome to We Act Radio, broadcasting live here for all uh, within the sounds of our voices. And you just saw what was probably one of the most um, illuminating photo, for classes of um, photography that I've ever seen. And I majored in communications, but the only class I took in my major was photography and it didn't touch anywhere near the historical aspects that this young lady is bringing to the table in her craft. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is Elena Volkova and she is here to continue this photography class and what has motivated her to take her craft to Anacostia to not only document, but to celebrate all those who represent the unabated of the nation's capital here in Washington, DC. Elena, welcome to We Act Radio. Thank you so much, Kimon. And thank you everybody for having me here. All right, that's yeah, so um, that's a great question. I've always been interested in historic processes. I went to school in, early 2000s and I learned photography through film and alternative processes. And then when I graduated in 2002, almost immediately everything went digital. So it's kind of a bittersweet moment for me. But um, how I ended up in Anacostia, that's a great question. I'm still asking myself that. Um, so I live in Baltimore. I've lived in Baltimore since 94. I immigrated from Ukraine, uh, from Kiev in, 94 and thought Baltimore was going to be a temporary thing, but I'm still here. <laughs> Funny how that happens, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Yeah. But um, I in 2018-19, uh, I reached out to Maryland Historical Society um, because the uh, 2019 mark 180th anniversary of photography since its first invention, daguerreotype. Okay. And I thought it would be nice to document 
to to celebrate this this grand event by creating an exhibition and digging through the archives of the historical society which is now Maryland Center for History and Culture they rebranded recently and my co-curator and I Joe Tropea um, who's been curator of photographs and films at the at the historical society we um, set a task to find all sorts of representations in, in the archive. And mind you, the archive started by wealthy um, Catholic families who thought that their legacies are important. And it started way before photography's invention. And somehow we found that all processes do not really represent the, you know, the community of Baltimore widely. Uh, so it was interesting. It was an interesting experience, even though um, Maryland Cent Center for History and Culture is doing everything they can to set the records straight and have been collecting Black archives and digitizing everything and doing a great job. Uh, so we had this idea, why not fix that and um, come up with a way to invite community to sit for these historic uh, processes. Uh, so that was about the same time when I started learning wet plate collodion. And uh, we organized several um, sessions at the Maryland Historical Society. And we, we found that it was interesting because we were hoping since the center exists, since the museum exists in this like vibrant community of Mount Vernon, then it's obvious, it was obvious to us that, you know, all sorts of people who live around the neighborhood will come. Um, and unfortunately, that was not the case. So that kind of opened questions about um, who is represented, who is seen in the museum archives, and how those people are welcomed, and who is not, who's been isolated and not well represented. So what we started doing is going into the communities and bringing the historic process to them. We did a session with youth program at Open Works. We um, went into Green Mound a Community Center uh, we had grant plans for continuing the project and kind of building an archive and then the pandemic started. So um, it all kind of like <laughs> froze, all our projects froze in space. Um, so 2021, you know, uh, a, over a year into the pandemic, uh, I was looking for something meaningful to do. And as a, you know, my creative practice had to, had to, had to be put on hold. Um, so I started kind of digging around and reaching out, thinking about, well, who else, who else I can partner with? And somebody suggested reaching out to Anacostia Art Center. We have um, Maryland Art Place who is you, run. Do you remember or recall who might have made that, that initial suggestion? Yeah, so Amy Kavanaugh, who runs uh, Maryland Art Place, she used to work at the um, Anacostia Art Center. Okay. And she Shout out to Amy out Kavanaugh. To, yes, yeah. Uh, so she put me in touch with um, Terrence and Jess. Hopefully she's no relation to the Kavanaugh that's on the Supreme Court that we got a problem with. You I'm, know. Sure she, I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm certain she's not. Uh, or, maybe, or maybe she was doing, doing this to make up for some of the damage she's done already, but <laughs> sorry, please, please continue. So yeah, so I reached out and um, um, Jess and Terrence were really excited and we applied for a grant. Um, and so I got some funding from Corcoran Women's Committee. Mm. And it's, a, it's an individual artist award that's given annually to either artists in DC or for an art project that benefits a DC community. Um, and it was, it was very interesting because I am an outsider in Anacostia. And in fact, as, as an immigrant, I feel like I'm an outsider anywhere in the US. So Look, my you're not the only one. So do I. And I and I was born here. But go ahead. Yes. <laughs> so it was it it was really interesting to kind of reflect on this sense of you know home. All my, my my creative work really focuses around this idea of what it means to to have a home and have an experience of a home. So it was interesting to be thinking about building relationships and how I am, uh, you, know, a, you know, a foreigner basically doing my thing and 
it was challenging to explain to people why I'm there um, and what is the creative process. Um, so that was that was an, an interesting journey. It was an interesting journey. Well, I have to say that it's it is quite fascinating that you ended up in in Acacia using this photography method, um, the wet plate collodion, uh, because the first uh, black person to move into Anacostia was the late great Frederick Douglass. And Frederick Douglass is the most photographed person of the 19th century. Um, it, you know, it's not Abraham Lincoln, it's not, you know, some Union um, guy, soldier, or, 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 or Confederate. It's actually Frederick Douglass. And he never smiled in any of them. And so when I saw your sample um, work, I really, I, I, I recognized where it came from. I'm like, oh, this is the original way they did the method that they did. And I remember in your, like we was watching in your well-produced um, uh, mini doc uh, at the beginning of our conversation, uh, a young lady said that it was like a time machine, it was like going back in, in, in time. And, and I can definitely concur because you got me looking like uh, Sam Jackson in, in Django. So I look just like that, you know? And, uh, and that's apropos as well, because my studio at we, we Act Radio, we designed this studio with Do The Right Thing in mind, the radio station and Do The Right Thing. We literally used that as a model for our storefront studio. So all these years, for 10 years, uh, we've been doing We Act Radio, I've been telling people I'm Sam Jackson and do the right thing. And now you take my picture and I look like Sam Jackson. Wrong movie, but I look like <laughs> Sam Jackson. So um, it's going back and then you're also making me getting a glimpse of what I'm gonna look like in years to come, you know? And so it was like a, it was like an eerie feeling. Cause I remember reading um, a book by Julia Cameron uh, called The Artist's Way. And in the book, The Artist's Way, which really holds a person's hands and help them come to grips with being an artist because you know it takes um, a lot of courage to declare first to yourself then to the world that I am an artist and this is what I do and so one of the the the, the learning moments in that book was that you have to write uh, a letter to yourself when you was a child from your your adult self and then you have to turn around and write a letter um, to yourself as an elder and you write this letter as a child to your adult self. So those three different letters. And I, those um, sitting with you conjured up some of those feelings I had when I was wrestling with that question on what to say. They're like seeing that imagery, something new, something old at the same time. Um, but what was it that led you to declare that first to yourself that you are an artist, then to the world that you're an artist, and then decide that this is what you're going to do? That's a great question, Kimon. I love this question. Well, I feel, first of all, I uh, hated school. <laughs> hey! Yay! <laughs> High five! <laughs> we <laughs> I like <just> learning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I went to, I grew up in Soviet Union and the school system was like a meat grinder. It was, it was terrible. And we had art until like sixth grade and that, that was it. And um, all everybody in my family, you know, we have a creative streak. And I was my my brother is an artist, and I was always grow up watching him. He's 15 years older than me. I'm like, ah, this is exactly what I want to do. I just had this identity since I was a child. And and then my mom wanted me to play piano, and I really hate, hated that too. So it was almost in. And in Ukraine, if you, unless you take art classes from a very early age, you really have no trajectory of becoming an artist. That's, that's not a thing. So it's like artists, they have to get good at all these things, drawing, you know, ceramics, and then you go into an art school um, and then that's your path. But if you're an adult-ish, right? You can't really study art. So when I came to the States, it was like, a, you know, I was 19, I had a little identity crisis. And um, luckily, I couldn't take any 
other classes without knowing English well, except for art classes. So I was, say, I was learning English in parallel. I was taking all these art classes at community college. And um, my professors were like, you, you should do this. You know, it was like one person had tells you, kind of breathe his life into you with that encouragement, with that, you know, because I feel like we're good because somebody told us we're good at something, right? It's that little encouragement when you're young yeah. that sets you up for some trajectory. Otherwise it's it's lonely and, you know, yeah. that's kind of how I started. And and then, you know, I, I took my first photography class uh, when I was about, you know, 20, 21. It was a darkroom photography and, and I knew right away that, that that was my path. You can't explain it. I, it it's magic. I think you did. I think you did. And I definitely uh, concur um, and readily identify with um, some of the points that you, you, you made. Um, and you kind of touched on someone in your mini documentary, but for the sake, uh, they always say that, you know, um, you're preaching to the choir where well, the choir needs practice. <laughs> um, so for the sake of redundancy, can you tell us again why you chose this mode of photography. You said that it was the 180th anniversary of photography. So I I wanted to learn wet plate for years. And then we had this opportunity in Baltimore, um, a local artist, Jay Gould is teaching workshops here. And he's a really great wet plate artist. Um, so I took a workshop with him and you know, it's always like your wheels are turning. What's gonna be next? What's gonna, what are you, what are you gonna do with it? You know, and um, portraits kind of seems like a like a, a really complicated task, like photographing people with this process where it doesn't make you any prettier or, or younger, right? It's it's only you know one at a time. You're and not gonna definitely does not make you prettier or younger. Absolutely not. <laughs> but it forces you to face the truth. This is the truth. They're showing you the truth within this context, you know, you know, as a famous song by Erica Badu, this is what I look without makeup. <laughs> <laughs> and, and whenever I'm doing um, television and whatever, um, I've always had to struggle with the producers trying to put makeup on me, you know, and I'm like, nah, they said, but you know, you, it's going to bring out all the, your imperfections. Like it's going to, I'm like, I can watch television and I can see these people with all this makeup on and they look fake, mm -hmm. you know? And I'm like, I'm trying to represent the truth. And so I resist the, the, make, the makeup. I don't do the powder, the foundation. I will take a, a, um, um, a towel, um, you know, a, a, some tissue and wipe some of the shine off, but they always want to take a brother's shine. <laughs> like, why they want to take a brother's shine? But I'll wipe, you know, my face a little bit to, to minimize the oil. But I want to, I want those perfections to be shown. Uh, I made that decision personally. So I don't look that great on, um, in the, these, these videos. And I don't look this, that great in some of these pictures. You took it to a whole nother level, but uh, I feel that what you have done is exposing the flaws and making us embrace them. Cause you, that's what you've done for me. I like, I even told you which picture I like the, I, I hate it the least, I should say. And you like, nah, that's, this is the one, <laughs> this is the one. So tell me how, how is that look meaningful to you? It's, that's how it's, it's, it's communicated to me, but how is that look meaningful to you? So I just want to say if a person hates, I like absolutely hates their portrait. And you know, some people when they sit for these portraits, we take two at a set in a session. We have 30 minutes together and we take two portraits and one stays with the project and one uh, goes with the sitter. So we have a conversation about, about exactly that. And there were people who we took like six portraits until we got to something they liked. Oh, and see. I, yeah. I took, you didn't have a chance. <laughs> yeah. I think our conversation went different because there was a band plan. Mm -hmm. um, and <clears throat> so we didn't have a long discussion about it. And, you know, I think that I was, um, I was conditioned, still conditioned to think like an American. In America, you know, we've been sold this, this false sense of choices. In America, they tell you paper or plastic. 
because those are your cho choices, right? Mm -hmm. But in actuality, you know, um, you can have your own bag and, and that bag is recyclable and you can use it over and over again. So it's not paper or plastic, right? But in that situation, I think I succumbed to that conditioning because I didn't ask, can we do another one? <laughs> can we do one, one a third shot, you know? Um, but again, uh, I'm glad it went down that way because you forced me to brutally force me to come to grips with what I'm going to look like in hopefully <laughs> a long time from now, you know, 25 years from now, uh, what I'm going to possibly look like. It looked like I had aged 25 years, you know, like I'm looking at, I'm like, wow, like you just, you know, you, you did that. And I'm like, that was like magic. That was like magic. So no, I'm, I'm glad that you, you, you chose the one that um, you did. I'm glad that you did that because you made me, um, Chris Rock says that um, comfort is the poison. And I think there's, there's no growth that can come from comfort. Um, we must go beyond our comfort zone. And your imagery is taking a lot of us um, um, beyond our comfort zone. Um, cause most of the time people take a picture until they do find something they like, um, certain angles on my good side and, and whatever, you know, but the bad picture, the good, the bad, and the ugly is still you. It's you. And I think there's some reality to be said about that, you know? So I, I feel indebted to you for teaching me, um, that valuable lesson. Um, it was there on the surface, but you made me go deeper with it. So you ain't got to worry about me uh, ever putting on um, uh, makeup um, going forward. But um, I appreciate your selflessness in that sense. Absolutely. But I had a lot of conversations. You know, not everybody um, just kind of embraces everything, right? And or embraces how this process ages your face. So I feel like the lighting has to be really specific. And, um, you know, as an aging woman myself, I, I, I get it. I get all of the, you know, you want, as, you know, people would share with me, like, this is my good side. I want to sit like this. Let's move the lights. You know, I, I love that feedback because then we're creating this portrait together, right? It's not me in control, having some vision about how people should look, but it's, it's, it's an exchange, it's feedback loop. And I think it's, it's part participatory. And that's very important to me yeah. that the, the participant, the person photographed actually has a say how they are represented. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about the, um, the celebration of the people who are represented Anacostia and how it's been um, um, projected to the community and how people, uh, the general public um, can come and, and share in this truth telling session that you have put on uh, wet plate. How is this? Okay, so uh, it took a while to get to that point when, uh, um, you know, people see the project on the walls of the gallery and- And the gallery is like, the ah, Hanpo yeah. Gallery located in the heart of Washington, D.C. Anacostia on Good Hope Road and Martin Luther King Avenue. Please mm -hmm. continue, let's keep it coming. Yes, thank you. Um, so I feel like it was still COVID. So ideally what I would have liked is um, having some sort of a community event where people are already there and then they would come and sit for a portrait and it's going to have a little more of a flow. We, it was in the middle of COVID, so we couldn't do it that way. Well, but that's how, exactly how mine went down. Yes, exactly. It was mystical okay. event. And, and oh, and I, I, I did my first, well, no, it was my second, it was my second. I did my second uh, IG um, video reel while I was sitting there um, getting my portrait done with you. And it is the most viewed reel I've ever had Bef um, obviously before and clearly afterwards. T 10,000 people watched that reel mm, of wow, me sitting there cool. with you. Wow. I didn't tell you that. I, I'd be sure to, um, to, tag you, to tag you on it because it was a band plan and it was a festive thing going on. It was some great bands playing actually. And it felt like it was, uh, um, it felt like it was 
um, a, a once in a lifetime type of experience, sitting there listening to some music I never heard before, sitting for a portrait in a production manner I've never seen before, you know, get my picture taken in a way it's never been done before. Like you, 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 you brought a unique aspect, um, a unique experience to my life. And I think you've done that for everyone who participated. And it's clear in your mini doc as, as they, they, they spoke of how this was a transformational experience with many of them, you know? So is that something that you consciously intended or is that just one of the resulting aspects of your work? Well, um, when I said for a portrait, I had a similar experience. It was magical and I didn't love the portraits but I appreciate it kind of like, as Whitney mentioned, time traveling. Mm -hmm. it, it, there is something absolutely magical. So I feel like you never know how people are going to react, uh, how people gonna, like what kind of feedback people gonna give you, because as you said, you know, they're, they're not, uh, if you wanted like a perfect photograph, you probably, digital is probably a better medium for this, but it's it's also mastering, right? I feel like I I have become a better portrait photographer after photographing a hundred people. So a lot of it, um, I know the process is magical, and nobody really takes it for granted, right? But being present with each person is is something special, and for me it has become as much about that as as like being present with a stranger and shaping and celebrating who they are yeah. in that like half an hour slot, right? And I hope that, you know, I feel the responsibility of producing a good image that um, the sitter likes. That's, that's, I'm responsible for that, absolutely. And I try to do the best I can and we'll spend an hour together if we have to. I think it's very given because you give a template to each participant, um, and the work is presented in a very honorable way. Can, uh, we just got a few minutes left here, but I wanted to talk to you about some of the specifics you address in your, your uh, mini doc. You talked about democratizing portraits and you talked about connecting with the past. Now, I like the new word I, I'm in love with is Afrofuturism because we're trying to figure out where we go from here. Martin Luther King's last book was called, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community, which I think summarizes what we are, are a task to face. Um, but in our culture, there's a, a Dinka symbol um, from the West Coast of Africa, Ghana, um, called uh, Sankofa, and it's, and it's a bird that's looking backwards. And it was basically saying that you have to take um, from your past in order to carry forward, you know? And I think your craft is, is, is doing that, but talk about democratizing portraits and connecting with the past. So the democratic, like right now, portraiture or any photography is, is, is totally democratized because anybody has the power to represent themselves and others, whatever, whichever way we want, right? So. But in, if you think about historic portraiture, I studied photography, so I know that, you know, before 2000, 2000 literally, there were no history of photography books that represented any Black photographers or women for, for, the, for in that case, right? So, but it doesn't mean that there were no Black photographers. There were exactly. Prominent... The great Gordon Potts come to mind. And there were great daguerreotype photographers and amazing historic studios in Harlem. And those representations exist, but until Deborah Willis probably like has been the most important instrumental author who has been working on, on her lifelong research about bringing history of photography, bringing some truth to the history of photography. So um, where am I going with this? So I'm going Great with this to... Right? We're talking about democratizing the portraits and connecting with the 
but it's also I feel like the the world is flooded with with snapshots and with selfies and then sometimes it's hard to to differentiate what's meaningful and what's not and of course it's up to every person but then I bet we have millions of photos on our phone and we never look at them and then you have this special thing you have this silver plate that is gonna sit on your shelf and you, you're you gonna look at it every day unless you put it away and then you won't. But do you know what I mean? That, so wet plate is be, has become just this extra, extra creation that somehow as an object is 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 real, right? It's, not, it, it's, it's an object. So I feel like as, as people, we hold on to objects, we cherish objects and they're meaningful to to our lives. So there is another concept that I like to think that these portraits are are meaningful to people who have sat for them. Yeah. And you, you know, you was alluding to the um to the fact that, you know, um, you know, portraits was almost, you know, elitist um to have your portrait taken um years ago. Everyone would, didn't have the availability because like you said, now we flood it but it was a drought before, and now you are um, taking a, a back, a homage um, to um, the, the value, the significance, the special, the magic of having your portrait taken. And um, we wanna thank you for the magic you, you brought to the table. So tell the folks about where they can see this and how long they can see this wonderful um, collage of work that you have created. Thanks, Kimon. So, um please follow us on Instagram, Anacostia underscore portraits. We post all the updates there. And um, the exhibition features, I haven't counted them, but I think it's around a hundred wet plate portraits, in addition to enlargements, digital scans that are bigger because they're quite impactful when they're big. And the exhibit is gonna be on view at Unfloor Gallery until June 18th. And we will be hosting some public sessions, which we will distribute through the local listserv, but also our Instagram is probably the best place to, to see the updates. And before I, before I forget, I have to give credit to my amazing husband who created this video for me and my, his name is um, Evgeny Kabanchik and my intern Lauren Brightwell, she's a student at Stevenson University where I teach, she's a, she just graduated with a degree in film. So mm -hmm. that was an amazing crew. My intern Jalen Thomas, she's been, she'll be graduating from our graphic design program. Um, yeah, and it's been, I, I wouldn't be able to do it alone. And Terrence Nichols and Jess Randall, just really, really yes. amazing people. Definitely shout out to Terrence Nichols, curator of the Han Floor. He just had a wonderful, um, exhibition at the uh, Strathmore Mansions um, with his exhibit, Pivot, all right? So shout out to Terrence Nichols. Uh, I wanna thank you so much for having the, the fourth, foresight and the bravery um, to do what you have done and, and, and definitely breaking free from the mold um, of uh, miseducation and, and claiming your artistry. Uh, I think it was Picasso that says that every Child's are artists. Uh, the the, the um, challenge is to um, maintain one uh, when you grow up because they try to beat it out of you. I'm glad they, that they did not succeed with you. Elena Volkova, artist behind Anacostia Portraits. And I just want to say thank you, Anacostia community, for welcoming my project and for all of the participants. And I hope to see you all again. And this is We Act Radio. Do something. And there you have it. First shot. No problem with you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, brothers and sisters, friends and enemies, democratizing portraits. This is Elena Volkova. And go see her work at Han Floor Gallery in the heart and soul of Anacostia. And that is on Good Hope Road and the intersection of Martin Luther King Avenue in Anacostia. And right next to Anacostia Art Center. This has been Kimon Freeman. We act radio. Do something. Stay dangerous. Hey folks, Roland Martin of TV One, the Tom Jones Morning Show, and you're listening to WEAC Radio. Do something.